it brings an end to uh, the, the question. I thank the, uh, the Minister. We must move on to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Mr. Hain, question one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, improving the access of SMEs to public procurement opportunities has been a key area of focus for the Procurement Board over the last three years. Under my chairmanship, the Board has overseen a programme to simplify processes, reduce bureaucracy and remove potential barriers to SMEs. Building on the recommendations made in the Finance and Personnel Committee's report on public procurement, CPD, in conjunction with centres of procurement expertise, has implemented a significant number of measures aimed at improving SME access. These include simplification of processes by focusing on producing clearer specifications, standardising terms and conditions for all contracts, removing the minimum eligibility requirements for low-value supplies and services contracts, and awarding contracts on lowest acceptable price where possible. In taking this programme forward, CPD has worked with business representatives and with the construction industry to ensure the widest possible acceptance of the proposals. The list of these measures is, is too long to read today, but I will arrange to make it available to members. More improvements are planned with the development of a new procurement portal called eTenders NI to be introduced in the autumn of this year. The new portal will help reduce the administrative burden on SMEs through the use of standardised templates and processes across the public sector. The portal will be aligned with the latest European procurement directives. Together with others, Northern Ireland has lobbied strongly for the relaxation of European regulations which have acted as barriers to SME participation in public contracts. I am pleased to say that there has been a positive response and the new directives are more SME friendly. Northern Ireland is currently working with Cabinet Office to ensure that these benefits are reflected through the transposing regulations. We just ask members to, uh, you know, if they're having conversations, not to interfere with the proceedings. Very loud murmurings of conversation there. I call Mr. Brady for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. I was going to ask the Minister what steps are in place to uh, level the playing field between SMEs and larger companies. I think he's answered that to a large extent because SMEs feel that they're not often on a level playing field when bidding for procurement against larger companies. But I thank the Minister for his answer. I think there, the member uses uh, the word perception. I think there is, there is definitely a perception that small and medium-sized enterprises in Northern Ireland, which are, of course, the, the bulk of our economy, accounting for some 99% roughly of, of, of businesses in Northern Ireland, there's certainly a perception that they are somehow disadvantaged when they're up against larger companies. I think all of the evidence, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I think this is what the committee found as well whenever it did its piece of work on procurement a couple of years ago, um, that in actual fact, Companies in Northern Ireland, firms from Northern Ireland who are small, medium, and size, are actually outperforming out, uh, much larger companies. And the experience that those firms are gaining from public procurement here in Northern Ireland stands them in good stead whenever they're bidding for work, for example, in the Irish Republic, where I think an interesting statistic is that we get more work, companies from Northern Ireland get more work in the Irish Republic in public procurement than the other way around. And uh, there is also particularly on the, on the capital side, whilst there's a downside to the fact that significant amounts of the work being carried out by our major construction firms, which are still medium-sized uh, firms, um, is now happening across the water, for example. Uh, the fact that they are able to go and win huge construction contracts, a lot of them in, in Scotland and some of them in England as well, I think is testimony not just to the, um, the skills that those firms based in Northern Ireland have, but the fact that they have been able to use significant capital spend in the past in Northern Ireland to get used to public procurement, and they're able to go over to Scotland, compete with Scottish firms, and win that work and bring that value back here to Northern Ireland. I call Mr. Trevor uh, Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and also can I thank the Minister for his answer, and I'm pleased that he sees the importance of small to medium enterprises here in Northern Ireland. However, can the Minister indicate maybe how many of those SMEs actually win uh, public sector contracts and how it compares with other parts of the UK? I thank the Member for his question, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and as I was saying in response to the now departing Mr. Brady, who is obviously very satisfied with the answers that he has got. Um, that during 20, during 20, that's caring, right? that's unfair, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, during 2012-13, a total of, um, just to give you a Northern Ireland example of the backup, the, the, the commentary that I made to, to Mr. Brady, 2012-13, um, a total of 2,889 contracts totaling 1.4 billion pounds were awarded, awarded by COPES, of which 79% were awarded to local businesses, 80% were awarded to SMEs, and 66% were awarded to SMEs based here in, in Northern Ireland. 
Those are our figures which I think compare quite favourably to uh, both Scotland and Wales. And I noticed, um, I think it was um, the leader of the Labour Party, Mr Miliband, uh, who the other day said that one of the targets for his government, should his, his party be elected to form the next government, was that 25 per cent of all contracts let um, in GB would go to, or uh, within England actually as it would be, would go to small to medium sized businesses. And as a member can tell from, from a situation where we have 66 per cent of those 2,889 contracts awarded to SMEs based in Northern Ireland were well ahead of the national average in this regard. And I call uh, Mr Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister um, what uh, processes are in place to ensure that uh, small and medium sized enterprises which supplies which supply goods uh, to government uh, to ensure that they are not excluded uh, by the um, requirement uh, involved in some tenders where a certain number of products have to be supplied and any company which cannot supply that particular number uh, therefore is excluded well, I mean, clearly, Nobody, nobody is excluded in the sense that any, any firm can, can bid for a range of contracts. I think it is so important whenever um, we as a customer are going out and procuring uh, goods or services or even capital projects that we're, we're mindful of the capacity of the, the firm that we are procuring from, that we're buying from, to deliver. And that's why, um, as the member has highlighted, Deputy Speaker, there will be occasions whenever there are uh, criteria around the viability of that business actually to deliver is assessed in the process. I, you know, I, I don't think we can... You know, I can't think of a specific example, nor would I go into a specific example in, in relation to procurement, but you can't have a multi-multi-million pound contract being delivered by a firm who has no experience of getting anywhere near that. You would have con considerable doubts in such a situation about their ability to deliver and therefore provide the service that we need, because ultimately people are relying. We're not just buying these goods just for the sake of it. Um, people are relying on the services that are delivered using those goods. So, it's important that we, as a, as, a, as a customer, have some degree of certainty, and that's why, um, from time to time, those sorts of thresholds will be part of the criteria in which we assess um, tenders on. Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. The Minister will be aware that one of the drawbacks and difficulties that SMEs have uh, when going through public procurement is that of experience, and it's the magic circle, how do they get experience without getting into the contracts first? So can the Minister explain what is his department is doing to actually help those contractors get the experience? But again, it, it in many ways relates to the question asked by, by uh, Mr Bradley. Um, and I think it, it is important, again, you, know, you wouldn't want to, to let a tender for a, a huge construction project to a firm who has no experience of Say a, say a hospital, for example, no experience of building a hospital, certainly no experience of building healthcare facilities on that scale. You would be, you would be worried about the um, ability of that firm to deliver that project, both on time and uh, within budget. So I think experience is, is one of those components that um, has to be there along with price and other considerations whenever you're weighing up um, tenders. Um, I think that uh, this is one of these gets to, to, to the heart of one of the sort of conundrums that there are. I think with, with procurement and why there is frequently no right answer because certain sets of circumstances will suit some suppliers and other sets of circumstances will suit others. And you know, I, I think in, in a situation where you go heavily on experience and there's and I understand some of the valid reasons why we want to go on an experience and that is seen to exclude other new firms or uh, perhaps even smaller firms. When you go down at that level, sometimes if you go down to no experience, then you, you maybe have risks about the validity of delivering a project, and you also have um, concerns um, about their, um, their, ex their experience in, in, in managing large-scale projects. So it is a fine balancing act procurement. It's one of the things that I've learned over the last number of years that um, there are different competing, whether it's value for money or um, whether it's um, getting um, SMEs to get more contracts. It's a fine balance to find. I think we have the balance more or less right in Northern Ireland, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be um, improving and constantly and continuously improving the processes that we have, and that's what, uh, with the, the help of the Procurement Board, we've been trying to do over the last year. Comments of Jim Allister. Yeah. Uh, why does the Minister not move towards multi-supplier framework agreements, which pertain in large measure in Great Britain? 
so that the work is divided into lots and therefore those of a particular interest who are smaller contractors can actually apply and compete. Is that not a road worth travelling and testing as it has, does seem to work much better in the rest of the UK? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if it, if it works much better in the rest of the UK. I think there are, there are issues, Deputy Speaker, of, of scale in respect of what might happen, say, within English departments or Whitehall departments and the scale that they're, they're going on. And they've had less of a concern about trying to use procurement to support SMEs, not least because their economy is structured somewhat differently to ours. The, the point that the member raises reminds me of the debate and discussion in this House and in committee rooms in this building um, seven or so years ago, whenever, uh, but, but from a reverse perspective, whenever procurement service and CPD had been moving towards um, bigger framework contracts with lots, and people were sort of turning their face against that, and a lot of suppliers were, were concerned about that. And the reason, one of the reasons, as you will recall from your time in the committee, uh, Deputy Speaker, was that once you fail to get onto a framework, uh, and I agree the framework can d deliver in terms of experience, and they can also deliver in terms of value for money, which is incredibly important in my position. At the end of the day, we should never lose sight of the fact we're trying to get services delivered or projects delivered in a value for money way through procurement. But there was a concern by some suppliers. If you were getting, if you failed to get onto, say, a five-year framework contract, that was you out of that type of work for a full five years, and that might negatively impact on that business. Now, I don't think procurement is here to solve all of our social or economic ills, but it was a concern that was listened to at the time, and there was a, a something of a retreat away from wholesale uh, frameworks contracts. Uh, we have been, I have to say, trying to make uh, progress in a, in a related way through uh, our collaborative procurement strategy, which was approved by the Procurement Board in June of, of last year, which is again looking at all of those areas across government uh, where there are common services, common goods, uh, common supplies that are purchased to try to drive value for money through that. I am very pleased to say that uh, against the target of saving £30 million over, over a three-year period, uh, the first two contracts that we looked at related to security and also to electricity, an 8.7 per cent in savings equating to nearly £2 million uh, saved to the public purse has already been achieved through collaborative procurement. But to go back to the point made with uh, Mr Elliott, there are balances to be struck. That was a useful question and detailed answer, but uh, can we just try and work to the three minutes? Number two. The executive recently endorsed my proposal to engage the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, more commonly known as the OECD, to conduct a strategic review of public sector reform in Northern Ireland. This independent review will outline what we are doing well and will identify areas where we can improve benchmarked against international best practice. The recommendations of the review will help shape the reform program going forward. In parallel, Public Sector Reform Division within my department has been developing a range of reform tools available to the civil service and wider public sector to support ministers in progressing public service improvements. For example, an innovation laboratory project took place last week. I have also recently launched an innovation scheme inviting staff to submit ideas which will generate real financial savings and or service delivery improvements. This scheme has been piloted initially within my department. Since February 2014, I have been engaged in a series of bilateral meetings with my executive colleagues. The support for the wider reform measures has been encouraging. We need to work collaboratively with departments, business areas and frontline staff as a catalyst and as an enabler of reform. Mr. Moutry, for a Thank you. I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister to outline the sort of work the OECD will carry out as part of its review? I thank the, the member for his, for his question, Deputy Speaker. I have to say, I repeat, that I am very pleased that executive colleagues have agreed to engage uh, the OECD to come and look at what we are doing in respect of, of public sector reform in Northern Ireland. There are two broad areas that uh, the terms of um, engagement will um, uh, terms of reference will in, in employ them to, to, to look at in terms of reform in Northern Ireland. The first is in those what might, describe, might be described as sort of cross-cutting areas uh, and levers uh, for making reform happen. So that's things like procurement, um, like HR policy, uh, like IT and digitalisation, and those are areas which are, by and large, uh, my responsibility as Minister for Finance and Personnel. So I want them to come in and look at those areas and make suggestions as to where we could improve what we do in procurement or what we do in HR or what we do in IT and digital delivery. Um, 
at all times benchmarking us against international best practice across the 34 uh, OECD member states. Um, and the second area of work um, that um, I have again received support from executive colleagues to look at is that particular areas of policy, so it could be within health, it could be within justice, it could be within education, um, where our ministers have either started already reform projects and they want to, again to mark those against international best practice or where they are considering reform um, that they again use that breadth of, of, of knowledge from the OECD to suggest where they might head in respect of, of reforming those policy areas within their department. I think it's, it's encouraging that the OECD and organisation of their stature has been willing to engage with the Northern Ireland Executive in this piece of work and I look forward to it starting over the next couple of months. Mr Deputy Speaker, it will be the first time that the OECD has done a public governance review um, of a sub-national government like ours and in that respect it's, it's something that's quite prestigious for Northern Ireland to be taking the lead in. Mr John Dallet. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer and I'm sure representing the Korean area we won't be a bit surprised that I ask for an assurance that the reform agenda does not include cutting public service jobs. Well, I've been very careful from, from starting. It's not, it's not just the coal rain that could apply to any part of Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, the jobs that he's particularly referring to, sometimes I think we fall into a bit of a trap. And just thinking that they're in, in coal rain, there are obviously other people around Northern Ireland affected too. Um, I've been careful to say from the start that the objective of reforming the public sector has not been to uh, reduce headcount. Um, we do have to accept, mind you, that we face significant public spending challenges over the next number of years. Our, as I was saying, and I think the member was present during the final stage of the budget bill earlier, we are already entering into 15-16 with about 1.5% coming off our budget as opposed to this current financial year. That puts our budget and public services under extreme pressure. And my whole mantra around reform has been fueled by not just that fact, but by the fact that if you project down the next five years down the line, that what Treasury, what the Office of Budget Responsibility are saying is that that kind of picture, particularly pressure on current expenditure, is here and it's here to stay. Um, and that's why I've been encouraging ministers, and I welcome the fact that um, they have all, uh, to a man and a woman, agreed with the sentiment that I've been, been pushing, that they, they don't look at cutting public services, although I do think there is scope for where services aren't working or where they have succeeded that sometimes we stop or we tone them down, um, but they look at how they can deliver and achieve better outcomes um, with what they have. And it's a, a elusive goal doing more for less. Um, it is challenging and it's difficult, but it is something that we have to embrace because the, the years ahead, both in terms of public spending cuts and the pressures that we will come under because of welfare reform penalties, make it essential that we continue to reform public services and that we make the best use of the people that we have. Uh, and use the innovation and creativity that I think that all of them possess. And I call Ms. Maid McLaughlin. Question number three, please. My department has regular constructive engagement with the Committee for Finance and Personnel. I am satisfied that my department has appropriate procedures in place regarding the provision of papers to the committee and will ensure that these are followed. However, as Minister, it is my responsibility to ensure that I am content with all the output of my department, including briefing for the committee. It is inevitable that there will be occasions where briefing material is not ready in time for committee deadlines. Well, Mr. May McLaughlin for supplement. Well, good, and I thank the Minister for his uh, response. But can I ask the Minister to also accept that there has been uh, a slowdown in the processing of papers and an increase indeed in the uh, lateness of papers to the committee? And would I accept that this isn't good enough and, and potentially can? And, and would undermine the workings of this assembly. I, I, I welcome the, the member and her interest in, in the, the workings of the Finance and Personnel Committee. I thought you had enough to worry about being chair of the, the Health Committee, but I'm sure our colleagues will, will welcome her concern about uh, the tardiness or other ways of, of papers being presented to the Finance Committee. Um, I have to say that my, my, my own party colleagues tell me that they've got plenty of work to do in terms of both what the committee itself does and what the department is supplying it with. Um, I do value, and I, I communicated with the department back in April, or with the committee back in April in respect of this, I do value having a good working relationship with the committee, as I'm sure any minister in this House would. Um, I have to say, though, that um, occasionally, and it is only occasionally, and I think the statistics bear this out, um, papers will not be able to be with the committee for a whole host of reasons. Um, 
within the sort of arbitrary deadlines that are set by the committee. And, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do think it's, an, it's ironic, I have to say, that a member of, of Sinn Féin would raise an issue about delaying things moving forward, yeah. given the track record of that party in many regards of this House and indeed the Executive. And whenever I saw this question put, put down, it um, sort of sparked something in my head about a, a paper that my department, in fact it wasn't even me, it was Mr Wilson whenever he was Minister, Mr Creus will be starting to smirk as he realises the, the issue that I'm talking about, and that's the review of the financial process. So here is a paper which has been put forward by my department to the executive for agreement to uh, change and reform our outdated budgetary process in this place. That paper has been with the executive since the 9th of March 2012, Ooh, right. held up by Sinn Féin. And I'm being criticised because papers are arriving a couple of days earlier, or later, I think that says it all. Well, Ms. Karen McEvitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the programme for government includes a commitment to include social clauses in all public procurement contracts for supplies, services and construction. I can confirm that all contracts should include social clauses for equality and health and safety. Beyond this, departments are free to define those social considerations that are to be linked to the subject matter of the contract or those that will be furthered by contract performance clauses or by a combination of both. The Procurement Board agreed that departments should set targets for the inclusion of social clauses and it monitors progress against these biannually. However, reporting has been inconsistent. I am disappointed to note that not all departments make returns and levels of assurance on accuracy and completeness of the figures that are provided are low. CPD is working with departments to improve the quality of returns, but I would also urge my ministerial colleagues to ensure that activity within their departmental areas is maximised and accurately recorded. More positively, CPD has, with the effect of uh, from 1 January of 2014, implemented detailed monitoring of training and employment clauses in construction contracts with values over £30,000 awarded by centres of procurement expertise. Returns for the first quarter ended on 31 March of 2014 indicate that contracts awarded during the period include 2,949 weeks of training, 308 weeks of student placements and 8,733 weeks of employment opportunities. This is substantially ahead of the figures reported by departments and presents a more positive picture. The scope for training and employment clauses on supplies and services contracts is less as they tend to be of shorter duration. However, CPD is working with departments to increase the level of activity in larger services contracts. Mr. Yeah, for thanks, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister has he any plans to increase the profile um, of the social clause in the public contracts, play in particular reference to the like of um, giving more opportunities to the young apprentice? Yeah, look, I mean, I think this is something that is a, is a programme for, for government commitment, and I have to admit I, I wasn't in the executive at the time. I thought it was an ambitious target to have them in, in all contracts, uh, and certainly when you look at some other jurisdictions, they have only including social clauses in contracts above a certain level, and that's uh, easier to do for, for lots of different ways. And, and, and so I'm, qu I'm quite pleased that what we have been able to achieve in terms of training and student placements and employment opportunities um, does seem to be going very well. I think it's, it's, it's harder to be able to categorically say that, given that uh, departments aren't consistent in reporting what they are doing. Uh, and this is something, an issue that was raised, as frequently raised actually at the Procurement Board, it was raised at our last meeting a couple of weeks ago. And I think it's important that CPD managing all of these on behalf of the whole executive um, can create uh, the sort of mechanisms for all departments to consistently report how many social clauses they are including in contracts, whether that's for training, whether that's for student placements, whether that's prompt payment or equality or health and safety or whatever it might be. Um, and then we can have a better picture as to how we're performing. And I suspect, Deputy Speaker, we are performing infinitely better than we were a number of years ago, but it is important that we are able to track uh, progress uh, up or down over the next number of years. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, by way of comparison, can the Minister outline how assessments of uh, social clauses and government contracts are monitored in, say, Scotland and Wales? Well, I think it's, it's, it's important, Deputy Speaker, that we do benchmark ourselves against particularly our, our, our near neighbours in, in respect to things, and particularly too, because 
I think there's no other policy area that I'm responsible for where I hear everybody else, um, Mr. Allister was at it earlier on, uh, everybody else described as being better at it than, than we are in Northern Ireland. And I do, I always recall a um, I think it was a Scottish Labour Party. Uh, we're always talking about how wonderful Scotland are procurement. Scottish Labour Party in their Assembly election manifesto a couple of years ago said that uh, public procurement in Scotland needed to be improved and they wanted to look at Northern Ireland, for example, as to how to improve it. So, you know, there's a bit of a sort of grass is always greener attitude about these types of things. But in respect of, of, of social clauses, the Welsh Government has developed guidance to support public sector organisations to adopt what they refer to as community benefits and as a list of um, priority policy areas which match up with their programme for government, but it doesn't set targets as, as they recognise that community benefits approaches can vary significantly from project to project. In Scotland, they have a, a piece of legislation um, which passed its third stage in, in, in May of, of 2014, legislating for community benefits. And again, that is, that is for all regulated procurements with values above £4 million. So whilst we may be having some difficulties in in measuring and assessing exactly and precisely where we are across all departments at this minute in time. I think we should be commended for the fact that our target is to include community benefit or social clauses, however they're referred to, in all public procurement contracts, whether they are capital, where it's easier, or in uh, supplies, where it's a little bit more difficult. We have said that it must be in all contracts and it's not above a certain threshold, and, and there's no targets being set as there is in, in, in Wales. So I think in many respects, Mr Deputy Speaker, in this regard, we are more advanced than our, our neighbours in Wales and in Scotland. Ms Rosie McCorley. I agree with you, Lars Concordia, August Gumbuyas Lesson Ira, as Dr. Agri Gujisha. Um, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister um, how are the outcomes from social clauses measured and tracked against local needs? Gorham well, Ayogut. Again, this is one of the. I mean, I think we need to bear in mind. Um, before I sort of start talking down what we have done too much or appear to be talking at time, we are in the early stages of developing and um, our approach to social clauses and guidance was only issued in the last little while to departments to try to more clearly define what social clause is and, and what they should be uh, adding into contract and respect contracts in respect of social clauses. Um, I think there is a degree of flexibility there within um, within the guidance to allow um, whilst there are Argu there are arguably social clauses of a kind in all contracts, in terms of particularly in construction, where there's health and safety, where there could be prompt payment, and of course there's always in respect of equality in terms of employment. Um, but no sort of broader, whether it's apprenticeships or youth employment and student placement, sometimes it's a, a bit harder um, to define. Um, so there is a flexibility for departments to define social considerations that they see fit for particular um, circumstances. Now, I think we always need to bear in mind that. At the end of the day, we still want contracts delivered, and we shouldn't be being deflected away from the good delivery of contracts by dreaming up ever imaginative and, and weird and wonderful social clauses. Um, but you know, I do think that there is that degree of flexibility there, as I understand, from the procurement guidance note that allows departments to consider um, social considerations that, and benefits that might flow from uh, social clauses within their contracts within a particular contract without it being a sort of a generic thing that's just slapped down from, from on, on, on high. Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I also thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, could, could the Minister detail the number of apprenticeships that have been achieved through this process so far within Northern Ireland, within GB, and within the European Union and elsewhere, arising from contracts issued by Northern Ireland government departments? <laughs> So just time to say no. I can't give that answer. <laughs> but, um, certainly not off the top of my head. I'll have to go away and, and start kind of doing a bit of long, uh, long table addition and all for all of that. But look, I, I will say if it's, it may not be possible to, to follow it through um, to the extent that the member wants, and, um, and I'm not sure whether he wants us to compare our performance versus others or just what Northern Ireland firms are doing elsewhere. But I'm happy to um, uh, converse and communicate with the member and, and try to get him a, an answer that he's looking for. No. That ends the, uh, the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Barry Michael Duff. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the fact that his department has published figures which show that over 25,000 people left the North last year, a figure higher than at any other time during the conflict, for example, will the Minister and his department recommend to the Executive? The development of a strategy to tackle emigration. 
I think I think before before we would I mean I, I, I take I take the point I think we, the member is genuinely concerned about uh, a mass movement of people outside of of Northern Ireland and, and, and clearly we want to we want to see as many people who are from Northern Ireland who are educated here actually then you know take root here and set up home and uh, have their own families and, and contribute to our economy and that's why you know I, I, w I very much welcome the fact that our economic strategy led by by Derry and Arlene Foster uh, is reaping benefits in terms of bringing in more jobs. I welcome the uh, announcement of nearly 500 jobs in Newry and First Derivatives today. I think it's good to, to see an announcement by a, a local firm increasing in that sort of scale. Um, and of course, I think that's one of the most important ways in which we keep uh, local people educated in Northern Ireland here and um, taking root in Northern Ireland, and uh, is by ensuring that our economy works. I understand the concerns that the, the member has. I think before we sort of jump to a range of conclusions, uh, we do need to spend a little bit of time in, in analysing the figures that were published at the tail end of last week to see whether that, was, uh, that movement outside of Northern Ireland was in some ways as it was perceived as enforced because of a lack of labour opportunities or whether it was more out of choice to avail of opportunities economically or in education that were presented to those people. Michael Duff for a supplement. Uh, thank you. Uh Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister. Can I suggest to the Minister that young people need a future, they need prospects of employment, and uh, I take on board the points made about job creation and, and job announcements in Uri and other areas recently, but would the Minister consider uh, p applying pressure on the European Union to widen the Youth Guarantee Scheme uh, so that it would operate on an all-island basis, for example? I think this is a this is an area which is the responsibility of the Minister for, for um, Employment and Learning. And as I am trying to rack my brains is what I what I picked up at the last NSMC plenary meeting that I was at. Um, but I think if I can recall rightly that, that Dr. Farry and his counterpart uh, Rory Quinn, the Education Minister in the South, uh, did take a look at um, whether the Youth Guarantee Scheme could be extended across uh, the whole of Ireland, because I think the situation in the South is that they get more generous benefit from it than, than we in Northern Ireland do. But I think because of some uh, a situation with the uh, criteria, I think it's called it's called nuts criteria, which seems appropriate sometimes when you think about it. Um, it doesn't apply to Northern Ireland in the way that it does to the South. Maybe there's more nuts there than there is here. I don't know. That's a dangerous one to start getting into. Um, but it is primarily an issue for the member, uh, the, the minister for uh, employment and learning. Uh, I think the member's point is right. That about uh, echoing the point that I made that. Uh, Improving economic conditions are key to ensuring that um, people who are migrating out of Northern Ireland for labour opportunities, or indeed um, those who are uh, young people who are unemployed, can get the opportunities that they have. And I, and I hope that with our economy growing by 2.6% and projected to grow by higher than that uh, this year, um, with unemployment continuing to fall, with investment by indigenous companies like First Derivatives and indeed others, that there are going to be opportunities so that the sort of migration that perhaps we've seen, particularly in some parts of Northern Ireland, is a thing of the past. And I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal, De Prin Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, on the 28th of May, um, your officials gave a briefing to the Finance and Personnel Committee in which they said there was a 50-year payback for PV systems on public buildings. Given that um, there's companies that are able to uh, provide free PV schemes which are profitable and homeowners can get a payback of seven years, how can the Minister stand over that, that payback period? I, I didn't quite, there was, was a bit of noise in the chamber. I don't know if you said 15 or 50. 50, 5 0. Um, well, I, I, have to, I, I will freely admit, Deputy Speaker, I'm not a, a, an expert on the payback of, of various renewable uh, sources of, of energy and power and heat. Um, you know, it does, I have to say, it sounds, it sounds a, a little high to, to me compared to what, whenever you consider uh, the plethora of these that are appearing on domestic properties across Northern Ireland. And, uh, I think there's no more, nobody is as savvy as a homeowner uh, who will calculate whether this is worth having an investment, albeit in most cases with a, a public uh, funded subsidy on it. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm not um, against using any sort, form of renewable uh, heat or energy on public buildings. Um, I think that certainly as we, um, part of the asset management strategy that my department is in, responsible for is looking at particularly saving money and not just in terms of rent and service charges and rates and things like that, but also on our energy consumption. A lot of the buildings that we 
currently populate as civil servants are quite old and therefore less energy efficient. Uh, and that whenever those leases run out, there's an opportunity to move to new buildings. And yes, we want to save money in terms of rent, in terms of rates, in terms of service charges, uh, in terms of getting more people into the space. But we also consider energy efficiency as part of that as well. And um, that does not exclude um, using the sort of uh, renewables that the member is talking about on existing buildings that we're, we're, we own. Mr. Agnew for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I, I welcome the Minister's answer. And, and for his information, the officials also said the payback period on solar thermal was 100 years, which to me just seems in, in, incredulous. Um, can, can I ask the Minister then, given what he, he said so far, that he, he will look at this issue and indeed um, push officials, his department, to support the work of the Deni Minister um, in promoting renewable energy by ensuring that this issue is looked at and um, we can look at the public estate and putting more renewables um, in public buildings? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to give that assurance. Uh, I think the one thing I would say is that I think the member would appreciate whether, whether 50 or 100 years or, or considerably less than that. It's a technology that is very much developing and you know, we could make a, an investment, a sizable investment now and find out that that maybe wasn't as good value for money in a couple of years' time as the technology advances. I suppose that is, that is always a risk, particularly with this type of thing. Um, and we've got to bear in mind whether we own the building or whether we don't own the building. And if we don't own the building, it isn't necessarily our responsibility to do that, to make that investment, even though we may be the, the beneficiary of all of it. So there are, there are wheels within wheels in all of this, but it's certainly not something that on principle that I object to, to taking a look at, particularly if that investment does have a good payback, a shorter payback than 50 years. Uh, I think we'll, 50 years would see all of our time in politics and then, and then some, but uh, there's some, some resistance to that. Um, and uh, I, I think that particularly where not only is it good for the environment, but it also saves a few pounds. I think it's important that we look at those opportunities whenever they arise. Well, Ms. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister outline what was discussed when he and the First Minister met the Governor of the Bank of England? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for, for a question. It was my, uh, and also the First Minister's first opportunity to meet with the new, relatively new Governor of, of the Bank of England, Mr. Mark Carney, whenever he was in, in Belfast at the tail end of last week. I very much welcome the opportunity to, to have a conversation and a full, frank, long conversation with him about a range of, of, of subjects. But as the, the House would have expected uh, somebody in my position, um, we focused on the economy and, and, and what he thought were the prospects for our economy, which I have to say are, are positive, um, but also concentrated on um, th that issue that we've talked about many times in this House, which is national lending initiatives uh, not reaching Northern Ireland and having an impact positively on businesses in Northern Ireland, and, and the, the need that there still appears to be talking to businesses and be business representative organisations in Northern Ireland, that there is still issues with access to finance. And I have to say the Governor listened to our uh, concerns. He understood the issues that we have with access to finance. He understood uh, the, the very different nature of our banking system in Northern Ireland and the problems that that has had, and particularly with uh, the issue of property overhang uh, influenced by our Irish banks. Um, and I think it was a useful conversation, and it's the start of a dialogue which we hope to, to keep up in the, in the years ahead. Ms. Hale, for a supplement. Thank you. Did the Minister discuss the impact of, of the, the, did the, sorry, did the Minister discuss the impact of the likely interest rate rises on people of Northern Ireland? We, we did, and I noticed that before, before we, had, we had our meeting, uh, he was quoted in the, the national news as talking about likely uh, interest rate rises and what level that they may be at, and of course it uh, inevitably did come up in, in conversation. Um, and I think it was, it was interesting, and the First Minister and I obviously came from a particular Northern Ireland perspective on this, and whilst we agreed, uh, I think, uh, with the, the Governor that with an improving economy, and if it rapidly improves, uh, there may be scope and space and room in time for him and the Monetary Policy Committee to look at interest rates. We did um, impress upon uh, the Governor the, the particular circumstances in Northern Ireland, particularly with whilst we are seeing improvement in our economy, the 2.6 growth uh, last year that I mentioned, uh, falling unemployment, uh, rising employment, that there are still issues with disposable income in Northern Ireland and that uh, therefore any sudden and uh, sizable increase in interest rates may have more of a negative effect here in Northern Ireland than it might in London and the South East or the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister 
on a question on family law review, particularly in respect of fathers' rights of custody and visiting rights, in light of Justice Coldridge's statement recently on access? What the Department? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm not particularly okay with the, the, the specifics of, of the uh, judge's uh, statement recently. Uh, this is, a, as a member will know, an incredibly sensitive area um, and you know, one where it is very difficult for any state, any government uh, to be in a position where it is almost arbitrating when those very difficult positions where uh, families have broken down and there is little scope for um, for them coming together and to agree what the best way to look after. At the end of the day, the focus that we should all have is on the, the children and their needs. And that's why we are uh, seeking to consult on this issue. But I, I, I move towards a consultation on family law in Northern Ireland, knowing full well that the very consultation itself will see diametrically opposed views in respect of what's the best way forward. And I think it's important that all of us in this House always bear in mind that the, the people that we should be considering first and foremost are the children and what is best for them in these uh, sorts of circumstances. Well, Mr. Ramsey, for a supplement. Yeah, I thank the Minister for his response. I, I would ask the Minister, and I welcome his response. We all are aware of family becoming estranged and the difficult circumstances that arise from that. Could I ask the Minister to reflect on Justice Coleridge's statement in the Court, and maybe at some stage we, we could have a discussion on the round that, maybe a possible meeting, to discuss a way forward on? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'll familiarise myself with the, the statement that the, the member refers to. Um, it is an area which I know, as I said, is, is fraught with difficulty in trying to move forward, but given that there is a um, Lots of conversations about trying to reform what is, in some respects, I think viewed as a bit of an outdated um, legal position. I think we, we need to um, consider all contributions that have been made uh, carefully and doing so, as I said, always bearing in mind that there are children and their rights and their, what's best for them that we have to consider and weigh up in the balance of it all. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister that last week, <coughs> He outlined his proposals to improve the delivery of major infrastructure projects and how he hopes to progress his plans. Yes, I, I am I'm very pleased to have been able to announce, um, and I've got, again, widespread support so far um, for my uh, suggestions, proposals for improving the delivery of major infrastructure projects, and they include cent a lot more centralisation of procurement and delivery of our projects, a development of a strategic pipeline of projects, and also trying to change the culture within the civil service uh, so that um, projects are delivered, delivered on time, delivered professionally. Um, I have some, some progress has already been made in terms of the first objective, which is to create a centralised procurement and delivery service. Um, the Health Minister and I have agreed that the transfer of Health Estates um, come to Central Procurement Director later in this year. I think that's important that uh, that expertise and experience that is there is then brought to the centre and that will benefit all of us. Um, in respect of overgreening a strategic pipeline of, of, of projects, that will require uh, executive agreement on that. But I think, as I've said in this House a few times before, um, I think the objective merits of doing such an approach are, are, are obvious, um, given that if we have a list of uh, strategic economic infrastructure projects that we can pick up of, of, uh, off a list as money becomes available. Uh, it can only ensure the, um, that we are spending our infrastructure capital budget wisely, but that will of course require executive agreement, but I hope that given that the proposals are sensible uh, that we do get support. Douglas for supplementary. Thank you Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and I thank you Minister for his answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister what is Northern Ireland's uh, capital budget looking like uh, over this next few years? The only, the only year that we can um, say with certainty is about this year and, and next year. Uh, and this year, after having experienced a, a 40 per cent reduction to our capital budget over uh, this budget period, we are now starting to get back up to um, the trend that we, we had before 2011, before the downturn. Um, this year alone, we entered for the into this financial year for the first time in three years with a starting position of over a billion pounds of capital to spend. Um, that rises very quickly to 1.6 billion whenever you consider our um, RRI borrowings and our uh, capital receipts. 
uh, and that gets us up not quite but close to where we were before 2011. Uh, and obviously I'm very keen to see all of that money spent and spent on strategically important projects. Moving forward, it would appear that um, certainly in 15-16 there is about a 1.5 to 2 per cent increase in our capital budget, likely even on top of that 1.6 uh, billion. So that also bodes well for Northern Ireland and our ability to develop and improve our infrastructure. Thank you, Minister. And that brings an end to the, question, or the period for questions to the Finance Minister. If the House would just take its ease, we change the top table.